So uh, our next talk is going to have a little bit of a personality uh, disorder, uh, well, because there's two speakers. Um, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Joe Rathbone and Joe Stringer from Infinity Works. We're going to start with a little bit of a story. So many, many years ago, I was working for a web company, and they ran a very popular web portal that had stuff like news articles and sports articles. And the platform it ran on was, was at capacity and it would regularly suffer service outages. And this was particularly bad when there was a really interesting football match on, because people would log in and try to look at all the live scores as they were happening. So one evening, Muggins here is on call, trying to support this platform. So I'm sat at home in, in my apartment, trying to eat my dinner, which is the expertly photoshopped meatballs. <laughs> so. I'm kind of sitting there eating my dinner, and all I've got to really gauge whether or not this system is on fire or not is a cacti graph that updates once every five minutes, which shows me the CPU usage aggregated across the, the web cluster. <clears throat> so I'm sat there munching away, occasionally glance up at this graph to see how perilously close to 100% are we right now. And I think, I think that night we just, just about scrape by with 90-something percent, so... Quite, quite a hairy evening. So yeah, not, not a great day for me. Yeah, so that's a cool story, Dan, but why is it relevant to us here today? That's a good question, Joe. So it's, <laughs> it's relevant. It's relevant because I think the point here is I had no visibility of what was going on. I knew whether the system was on fire or if it wasn't on fire. That was kind of it. There was no fine-grained real-time monitoring. Yep. So it's about really the importance of that, being able to have that so I can see what's going on. I can proactively even fix a problem before it happens. Yeah. So that's kind of the crux of what we're talking about today is kind of is fine-grained real-time monitoring. Yep, absolutely. So we're going to talk to you a bit about our data processing system we're on at the minute. It runs Apache uh, Spark, the PySpark Python. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about the failed attempts we had on getting it instrumented, some of the crazy ideas we tried to get the instrumentation working, and then the solution we have at the minute that's actually working and gives us all our nice Grafana graphs. So do you want to tell us a bit about the project, Dan? I do, yes. Okay, so <laughs> this is kind of it in a nutshell. So. It's, we're a consultancy company, so we work on behalf of clients. So this, is, this is a system for the, the major publicly owned healthcare provider in the UK. Someone will be able to guess who that is. Uh, so principally, this receives data from hospitals. This list files up in the top. So those files contain a lot of XML about what the hospitals have been doing. So stuff like operations they've performed, patients they've seen, this kind of stuff. And it all goes down into this cluster at the bottom. So that's, that's a big load of uh, homogenous servers all running Apache Spark and running React as our NoSQL database. The other side of it is these users at the top left there. So those users want to be able to generate reports based off that data, which tell them how much to pay the hospital for the work that they've done. So that's kind of the, the, the main bulk of the work is generating those reports. And that's what we use Spark to do. And it's really Spark that we're talking about today, how to instrument the stuff running under Spark. Well, you've got to tell us a little bit more about Spark then. Yep, good idea. Let's do that. So all our code's written in Python, which isn't a great fit for Spark because Spark is a JVM thing. So the way it kind of works is it's separated into these two halves. You've got the local half and the cluster half. So you start off on the left-hand side with the Spark context. So that's the Python call, basically, which then talks to the JVM. And this is all on a single point, so a single server. That JVM then spins out to the, the cluster nodes. This is your many nodes, and starts up these Spark worker JVMs. They, in turn, then spin up lots of Python worker processes. So this is all on one machine still, but replicated many times for all the machines you've got. So you kind of start off in Python and you end up in Python, and the Python's what actually runs all your, all your jobs, it applies all your logic and processes your data, but you have this kind of like JVM abstraction thing in the middle, which does all the cluster orchestration. Yeah, and that's where some of the challenges start to come up with trying to in instrument it. 
the Python workers are the ones doing the work, but they're over on this side, and there's got all this Java going on in the middle. So the Python workers themselves, we don't really know much about them. We don't really know when they spin up. We don't know exactly how many there are half the time. And then the workers themselves, there's no shared states between them. They don't know about each other. Just lots of all little bits that make it kind of difficult to bring the instrumentation together in something that makes sense. Indeed. So what do we do to get started then, Dan? That's a good question. So we're using Python. Prometheus has a very good Python client library, so yeah. we'll just use that. Yeah, so just like normal, just import it and away you go? Yeah, just do all the normal stuff, import the library, start adding your instrumentation bits and your counters and your gauges. Yep. Tell it to listen on a port. Yeah. And then we tell Prometheus to scrape that port. Yeah. What else is there? Well, all the work happens over here on the right, so like, which one do you scrape? Hmm. <laughs> Another good question. Yeah, so, for example, in this diagram, we have six workers on a node. We actually have 24 on our production. So they're all going to try and listen on the same port. So that's obviously not going to work. Yep. So could we maybe manually configure each process to have a different port? Well, do we have any initialization control over these worker processes? Nope. Is that going to work? Nope. OK. OK, so <laughs> if we know there are six processes, and we know we're, say, process number three of six, can we say add three to the base port number so they've all got like a sequential port number or something? Again, do we know we're three of six? No. Nope. Okay, next idea. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so as you can see, we kind of fell at the first hurdle. Like even just trying to scrape our metrics was a challenge. So. Yeah, so what was next then? Next was, please don't kick me, the push gateway. <laughs> 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 please, so please don't kick me. Not yet. Um, so this is an excerpt from the, the Prometheus documentation about the push gateway. So it says, occasionally you'll need to monitor components which cannot be scraped. Hi. Yeah. That says, they might leave behind a firewall. They might be too short-lived to expose data. Yeah. That says as well. So the push gateway allows you to push time series from these components to an intermediary job, which Prometheus can scrape. So yeah. this sounds brilliant. So, yeah. so what this is telling me to do is to run one push gateway on each of our servers and then get all our Python workers to push data into it. Yeah, but hang on a minute. Doesn't it also say this in the documentation? The yes, it, push gateway is explicitly not an aggregator or distributed counter, but rather a metrics cache. I think you're right. It does say that as well. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not quite sure we understood what this meant at the time because we, pl we plowed on with this. <laughs> We, we plowed on with this solution, and to be honest with you, it was a total unmitigated disaster. So, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> what was happening was each of our Python processes had a completely different and a completely independent view of what all our counters should be set to and what all our gauges should be set to. And then when they push into the push gateway, they all just overwrite each other. So you end up with junk. You end up with no value whatsoever. Yeah, not great, but so... Where do we go from here? Well, the next idea was, let's just not bother. What? No metrics at all? Yeah, well, not, not quite. We thought, let's not bother instrumenting the stuff out on the cluster. Let's try and do it where it's a bit easier at the single point on the, the local bit in Spark's terminology. Yep. Let's just instrument there. So we tried that. But that meant we had to kind of do all our counting ourselves, do all our aggregation ourselves. So we did it all in Python. Uh, and then use Spark to fold it all back to the, to the single point, and then we can scrape it. The downside of that is we get all the counters and stuff right at the end of the job, like that. Yeah, not ideal. So obviously, we really wanted to get the real-time view back. So how about any crazy ideas to get that working? We did have some crazy ideas. Yeah, so we thought, could we do something like the push gateway wasn't aggregating for us. So could we say, write our own version of the push gateway that did aggregation? We could maybe send it like counter increments over UDP or something. Yeah, that sounds not great. <laughs> yeah, I think some people just got the joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that never really got, really got me on the conversation. So then we thought, could we use like uh, something like StatsD in some sort of proxy arrangement to do some aggregation? Yeah. Uh, possible, but 
Yeah, we're at the Prometheus conference, so surely we can get Prometheus to do everything we could possibly dream of. Let's hope so. <laughs> or they are going to kick us. <laughs> so yeah, how would we do it in Prometheus then? Um, so what about this text collector stuff it's got? The text collector. So that's, that's the thing where you dump metrics into a text file in a directory and then the node exporter ingests them. Is that that? Yeah, exactly. So we can maybe sort of get all of our Python workers to write out their metrics and then get that picked up by the text collector. And then obviously node exports creates that, ends up in Prometheus. It's happy days. But we'll still have the problem of the sort of overwriting counters. So we might have to maybe use the process ID mm -hmm. as a label. OK. Because that might work. <laughs> OK, so we've, we've solved the scraping problem. Yep. Because now we're just scraping the node exporter. Yep. OK. So using the process ID as a label. Yeah. So these workers are, are ephemeral processes. Yeah. They're going to recycle. So we're going to create lots of process IDs, lots of time series. Is that, is that, that going to be a problem? Um, well, we can try it. We've got a massive test suite. We've got loads of tests we can run. And so we did that. And so we ran it all locally. And it looked pretty good. So the Spark workers sort of stayed around for quite a while. So we didn't end up with that many PIDs. So not that many labels, not that many time series. Yeah, looked, looked pretty good. Ran in the test environments. All not too bad with, with tests. OK, so, <laughs> so you're standing up in front of 200 odd ops professionals yep. and saying it worked in dev. Oh, it worked really well on my machine. <laughs> OK, this kicking's looking quite, quite likely. <laughs> so what about production? How did that fare? Yeah, no, it, we really broke it. <laughs> so obviously, we ended up with quite a lot of labels from all of those process IDs. We found in our long running jobs that as it was sort of moving real world data sets around between the cluster state and the local state, that the Python workers were getting killed off a lot. The Spark logic around that is quite simple. They sort of look if they've done any work for 60 seconds and if not, kill them off. So yeah, lots of processes, lots of labels, not good. So how many time series did we create? Well, we did try and ask the API to tell us that, but it kind of hung for 45 minutes and we got a bit bored <laughs> after that. So uh, who knows? <laughs> OK, so, so we've gone from quite coarse grained metrics to yeah. no metrics. Yeah, well, just like your other idea. But, yeah, OK. But yeah. So where, where do we go from here then? Yeah, um, well, there's also this thing in a way, called the multi-proc mode. Multi-proc mode? Yeah. What, what's all that about, then? Um, so it kind of uses a directory as the shared registry. So each of the Python workers could write out some data, and then we sort of follow the same pattern as before. OK. Do we still need the text collector, then? Yeah, because that's still going to be the bit that we actually scrape the metrics from. OK. There's quite a few moving parts now. Have we got like a pretty diagram that explains it? Yes, we do. Whoa. <laughs> Handy. So yeah. Just as before, but we've just got this extra little layer in. Still got the Python workers across the top, but each time they, they just write out to a data file that's within this multi-proc directory. And then every so often in our code, we tell it to flush out the metrics where it collates all of the counters it can find and writes them out as a text collector metrics file, just as before, still picked up by the node exporter, still scraped into Prometheus. OK. So if you're wondering, like, does this add loads of complexity to the code? It isn't that bad. So this is this is uh, where we start off. So the first line is just just a totally vanilla Prometheus counter increment. So that prom consolidation count, that's just a counter object, and we're incrementing it by some value. The only tax we have to pay on that is we have to call this periodic flush function every time we touch a metric. So let's just have a look at that. Yep, nothing too crazy in here. So we sort of just have a sort of arbitrary 10 second uh, interval of flushing the metrics out. So that's sort of a balance between not having the code obviously write these files out all the time, but still within our Prometheus uh, scrape timings. So we just, yeah, check the current time, check the last flush time, check it's outside the interval. And then if we do need to flush the metrics, we just use the standard Prometheus uh, Python libraries uh, write to text file 
So just as we were doing earlier, but without all the crazy PID stuff in the way. And yeah, still still works, still gets into Prometheus. What about initializing it? Yeah, that's not too bad. So you just sort of tell it to use a multi-process registry. That's those couple of lines at the top. And you also just set an environment variable to tell it what folder that is. Yeah, so most of that stuff's really, really basic code. There's not, not doing anything particularly onerous. And the writing out to the file, that's only once every 10 seconds. So it, it's not really adding any overhead. And the great thing about this approach is it works. So we've actually got it running in production now, as evidenced by the pretty graph. So what's, what it is allowing us to do now is, as we were talking about earlier on, is trying to get really deep down inside what, what, are, our, what are our report jobs actually doing. So now we can see that all our jobs follow this sort of same this set pattern. So the blue stuff at the, at the, at the side, that's a, that's a phase called loading. So very basically, that's loading data out of the database. So it's a load of reads. And it's loading that data into memory and giving it to Spark. And then you have the second phase, which is basically all the business logic. So all those phases there are called stuff like projecting and uh, linking and grouping, which are all just like business logic specific things. So we've been able to see exactly what's going on. Whereas previously, we just had that, which is obviously not of much use. So what we've been able to do now is, with that new vision of what's actually happening, we've been able to then correlate that with resource utilization and so that I can get a better understanding of what's going on. So you see in the top left, that's, that's our uh, business logic level graph. And you can see when we're reading from the database, doing the loading phase, the graph here, React gets, correlates. Additionally, disk time correlates. So you know when you read from a database, it hits the disk. Who thought? And then the business logic stuff, that correlates with high CPU. So we kind, of, we kind of had a feel that this was the sort of thing that was going on. But now we can really confidently say, oh yeah, this phase is really CPU intensive. And it occurs at this point and after this and before this. So this, is, this knowledge is now starting to drive our behaviors. So the, the loading phase, again, was, is quite variable in its performance. So on here, it's running around 12,000 reads per second. But we sometimes see it around about 3,000. So we, we looked at that, why that is, and we attributed it to the, the effect of the page cache, which kind of led us on to thinking, well, should we then start considering buying some solid state read cache cards to put in the service and this kind of stuff? We, and we would have never been able to like, gather that evidence before to actually inform that work. So it started to drive platform improvements along those lines. Yep, absolutely. And that's what we really wanted to get across today is how worthwhile it is to get the real-time instrumentation deep into your applications. This gives us so much benefits just, just by knowing what's going on, just being able to see it up on our wall boards every day. And then, yeah, as Dan just said, we're actually driving our decisions on how we advance this platform for going forward. Uh, the next key bit is nothing's uninstrumentable. It might be a bit difficult. Apache Spark looked pretty crazy black box when we first started working on it. But obviously, as normal, lots of iterations, constantly improving. That'll get it gets you to some solutions that often really are quite simple and work really well for your use case. And the last bit is really just a shout out to Prometheus. It's been great for me personally to learn it on this project, and uh, it is pretty flexible, as we just said. You know, it's come out of a world of web APIs where things were much much quicker than our multi-hour Spark jobs in some worst cases, but it works and it's great. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for listening. All right, question time. Did you run into performance problems with having lots and lots of files uh, being read by the multiprocess collector? Um, no, we just delete them really quickly because uh, uh, there's just a, at the minute it's just a nice simple cron, cron job that checks for when they were last. Uh, modified or accessed or created or something and gets rid of them after about an hour. So it seems to be working quite well. Uh, you're not meant, you're meant to delete those when the application restarts. Oh, well, see so that's again where it comes a bit complicated because the master process where the Spark jobs come from is always running. So it's kind of hard to tell exactly when the Python workers die. Hence why we sort of have the quite naive cron tab to clean them up afterwards. 
Yeah, they just silently die. So that, that spark code we had on the screen before, it's totally out of our hands. They're just going to die at some point. There's nothing you can do about it. So it's like a continuous spark job, or a job runs for an hour, a job runs for an hour, a job runs for an hour? A little bit of both. So the kind of the stuff right at the front, Spark context stuff, that runs indefinitely, and the cluster, the, the, the J, cluster JVMs kind of run indefinitely. But the jobs are you know, do one for an hour and then another one for an hour, and obviously during those jobs there were there were sort of gaps, and that's where that's when Spark jumps in and says, "Yep, you're not having that work anymore," which is very useful. So you're going to break race if you're deleting those files. We're going to break race because the counters will go down. Yeah. So just watch out for that. We've not seen it break rates, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're just using gauges. No, we're using, we're using counters and rates. One more over here. So, great talk. Uh, interesting insights. Uh, how about your act? Did you rehearse it a lot? <laughs> Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, this is my first time public speaking. So yeah, we rehearsed this quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. But I do have to sit next to him at work all the time. So, <laughs> so do I. Um, <clears throat> how big was this project in terms of time and people <laughs> and maybe paying? Uh, it, it was pretty big, so it started around about May two years ago, so what's that, two, two and a third years, something like that. Um, the team, there's probably about 30 engineers on it now. Um, in terms of kit, the, the production clusters run 18 physical servers in one data centre and another 18 in another data centre. Then there's probably the same again of supporting servers. And then we have all that copied again for a reference environment. And then we have like test environments and dev environments. So there's a lot of infrastructure as well. So yeah. Were you pain, asking about pain wise? Yeah, but just this uh, Prometheus part. Oh, the Prometheus part. Um, Did it take two years? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it didn't take very long, really. I mean, I was probably working on it for three or four weeks to break the back of it and get it in there. Um, we've just been iterating on it ever since. So I think we started with three dashboards and we've probably got about 30 now. Any other questions? I oh, want yeah. here. Oh, it works. Huh? So you know a lot about what's Python doing, but you, you didn't get to monitor the Java part, I guess. Did you try to dig into that? Yes, we've we have got monitoring on the JVM. So there's the uh, GemX exporter. So we've deployed that. Um, but to be honest, it doesn't really give us anything that's that useful. It sort of says, yeah, lots of garbage collects happen, and it uses some of its memory, but it, it never it never really tells you anything that's that useful. So somewhat related to that question potentially. Um, your Spark contexts, how long are they actually running for? What's the longest duration your context has, your context, a context has been alive for? Um, probably a week, probably runs for a week. Cool. Yeah, the context is we, context. <laughs> the context of the context. Yeah, we, we face a similar challenge. We're very much a no Python Java based, but our contexts are multi-week and very long job durations. Yeah. So it's yeah a similar challenge, um, and it's that JVM monitoring piece that is the, the bigger challenge as opposed to the business metrics piece. Yeah. Okay. We, we used to spin up a new context for every job, but there's an overhead with that, so it's not doing that saves us a lot of time. Hi. Uh, I wanted to know if you are also involved into uh, maintaining the React database, and if yes, now that Basho is dead, uh, are you doing anything <laughs> related to that? <laughs> Yeah, so the context for those aren't aware, the, the, the company behind React called Basho, they went into administration last, last month, I think. So that's been interesting. Um, we're, we're not involved in contributing it. Well, Infinity Works aren't. Um, our client is, however, so they are kind of adopting it and they're, they're working on some improvements, which, which may well see 
Light of Day is a new version, if all goes well. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers.